This is JJ Pianchi of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign interviewing Stuart Albert on October 18th, 2017 at the University Library. Where and when were you born? Tucson, Arizona, March 18th, 1964. Okay. Who are or were your parents and what are or were their occupations? My parents were John D. Albert, lift truck assembler and farmer, uh, Carol J. Albert, school teacher. Do you have any siblings? I have five. Were any of them, who were they and did any of them serve in the military? Mm, no, uh, the eldest is Kathy, then Michael, then April, then myself, then John. None served in the military. I think Michael wanted to, but his eyesight was too poor due to a childhood operation. What were you doing before you entered the service? Uh, working in a camshaft plant, basically. It made other truck parts, but primarily camshafts and uh, just not saving a dime because I was going out partying with my friends. And I was like, this is no way to get back to school. Mm -hmm. So so you joined for the GI Bill? <laughs> yes, I'm a mercenary. <laughs> okay. What branch of the military did you serve in? Army. Uh, why did you choose the Army? It offered the most benefits for the shortest active enlistment. Okay. What happened when you departed for training camp and during your early days of training? Uh, pretty much anything you see on a YouTube video is going to be fairly accurate. Full metal jacket, good God, no, it wasn't anything <laughs> like that. But, uh, uh, the usual psychological head games you would play if you had to herd, shepherd, protect, and instruct a bunch of 18 to 25 year old primates. <laughs> and what was that like? Can you give an example? Uh, when you could get outside yourself and see what the purpose was it was actually very interesting, but it's like watching a game and playing in the game at the same time. So uh, in the game wasn't so much fun, but in odd moments when you see what they're up to, you're like, oh, well, this instills a certain confidence. It's not organized chaos. There's a, there's a methodology here. Okay. Do you recall your instructors? And if so, what were they like? Uh, let's see. Drill Sergeant Morton was an enormous Dudley Do-Right look-alike who was a fundamentally decent man who went to great pains to appear uh, angry at all times. Uh, Drill Sergeant Tim was a scrawny little redneck who did not have to fake being mean, although I also think he was fundamentally decent. He just found his godsend occupation. And there was Drill Sergeant Drumright, who was the scariest of all because he seemed to be coming from random directions in outer space. So you knew Morton could no doubt hurt you the worst, although he probably could never be pushed to that. You knew that Tim had the bloodlust to hurt you, but re refrained because he'd taken certain oaths. And you never knew what Drumright was going to do. Okay. So unpredictable. Alien. Did you receive any specialized training, and if so, in what? Uh, all of us in my cohort went 11 X-ray, which is infantryman uh, subclassification unassigned. Uh, and then they shoved you off where they thought your particular talents, like all the guys who got high mass scores ended up becoming a mortarman or an indirect fire infantryman, which is what happened to me. I thought I was going to be 11 Bravo rifleman and suddenly out with the vaudeville cane and no, over here with all the other nerds. Okay. How did you adapt to military life, including the physical regimen, barracks, food, and social life? Uh, well, the food was probably the easiest because it was the lowest on the totem pole. You knew you were going to get fed. You had no time or incentive to care about what. Uh, barracks, not that different from a dormitory, except you're a lot closer. There are no walls. 
other guys do disgusting things in their sleep. Um, let's see, what were the other subcategories? The, the physical training? Physical regimen and social life. Uh, running was a particular bait and aura of mine. I could do push-ups reasonably well and was rather good at sit-ups, but no one ever took the time to instruct me in how to use my legs. So I really think I was putting in more effort than I actually saw gain. Uh, social life, like high school, except with more rules and supervision, I would say probably physically less dangerous than high school, because there are more rules and supervision. Gotcha. Where were you stationed? I was stationed in Amberg, a small town outside of Nuremberg. Um, it's a pretty town, not much of a claim to distinction, although as small as it is, roughly the size of Urbana when the students are gone. Uh, it had 12 breweries, one of which dated back to the 1400s. Um, yeah, Amberg, near Nuremberg. Okay. So was that the only place that you were if you were abroad, when you were abroad? Uh, no. We found out well into my tour when I was starting to uh, anticipate. You know, I wasn't short yet, but I was anticipating shortness. Uh, found out that we were going to be deployed to the Persian Gulf with the rest of Seventh Corps. Uh, it always kind of amused me because uh, our colonel was uh, one of these pompous guys from the East Coast, and he at our uh, weekly formation came out and told us we weren't going anywhere. Our security mission on the Czechoslovakian border was just too important. Well, some of the guys stayed up and watched the Saturday Night News and saw Dick Cheney's announcement that the second ACR will be mobilizing out of... I was like, yeah, how typical of Scott to pretend to know. <laughs> So you pretty much understood that you were being deployed from television rather than from the chain of command. Well, <laughs> let, let's say that that particular verbal document was uh, edited <laughs> afterwards. Okay. So then you were going to the Persian Gulf. Where in the Persian Gulf did you go? Uh, initially, we... I remember we sat down in some kind of air base in Saudi Arabia. I don't remember the names of the distinct places in Saudi Arabia real well. Uh, we went to a tent city. It was hot as hell. Uh, and then after that, we deployed to our kind of wait and watch position in the trucial zone that used to exist, that little diamond-shaped patch of ground that nobody had any clear rights to or everybody thought belonged to them. Mm -hmm. And that's where Seventh Corps went and some Brits and some of the airborne guys and some first cav and Big Red One was behind us. The, uh, I think there are Big Red One, motorized infantry, mechanized infantry. Anyway, guys with more armor than we had. Got you. And you were a mortarman? Yes. Okay. And so what was, I mean, what were some memories of your time both in the desert and in your time in Germany? Like, either one, both. Uh, Germany was, except for field problems, a lot like a civilian job. Uh, you know, you put in your eight to five, you know, roughly. Um, then you go off base in your civilian clothes and get drunk, eat German food, uh, play with your fellow GIs, uh, sometimes catch the train to Nuremberg if you wanted some culture. Nuremberg had a five-story bookstore out of which maybe one entire shelf was English language books. So that was the place to go. Go to Hugendubels. Find the stuff you can actually read. Um, <laughs> The desert, uh, more boring, definitely more stinky. Uh, I already knew to expect it to be cold at night because I was, you know, kind of born in the desert, so I know about these things. Uh, most interest, what I tell most people about 
day from both experiences. I got to see some damned odd wildlife. Like? Well, I saw an animal that I was later able to identify as a baby chamois at a field problem in Grafenvir. Uh, many people said that no such animal could exist from my physical descriptions, but I found a picture of one and then, ha ha, that's what it is. Um, saw the ugliest lizard in Iraq, but, uh, oh, things hideous, JJ. Had <laughs> translucent skin like a baby, mm. had gold eyes like a BB, and it was a little short bodied fat thing. You'd almost think it was a frog instead of a tail, you know. I uncovered him, I was like, what is something as repulsively vulnerable looking as you being down here in the sand? Then I thought, you're probably happier there, and I'm happier <laughs> with you covered up. So I covered him back up. It was, it, it was kind to both of us. <laughs> covered him back up. Gotcha. Did you ever find out what he was? No, that one still evades me. Gotcha. So what were you doing over in Iraq? That's an interesting question. Uh, the first two days were mostly movement. Uh, the third and into the fourth day was staying awake waiting for fire missions. Uh, and then after that it was just kind of setting up a screen line on a perimeter and refugees would drift through and we'd give them water and food and tell them no they couldn't sleep with us but they could sleep just outside. Mm -hmm. You know, just outside our perimeter. Um, let's see, what else? Remember, I burned shit on Christmas Day. That was fun. And that's another thing I like to describe to people. Not many people have had the experience of burning shit. And I uh, know what to use as the accelerant. I know, first time we were using diesel. And uh, JJ, I know you're a driver and a writer, so you might know this already. Mm -hmm. But gasoline, it ain't. I didn't know this, and it looked like something out of a Wiley e. Coyote sketch. Light the match. Hold it at arm's length. You've just put the match out in the diesel. <laughs> diesel has to be coaxed into burning if it burns at all. Whereas used motor oil, boom, it goes up like something off of a kiss set. You know, through the blasts of crimson flames, you could see drifting down little pieces of ash that were once someone's feces. So that was your excitement on Christmas Day? Uh, you know, I thought it was a Dantean thing to be doing that close to the Holy Land on Christmas Day, and I thought Dantean thoughts as I stirred. <laughs> there you go. Um, <clears throat> so how long were you in Iraq? Uh, in Iraq, let's see. I'm going to guesstimate here and get everything wrong. But I... Do you know we had the waiting period, we had the four days of ground combat, and then another waiting period where we were basically just watching the perimeter and taking in or processing, you know, people who came drifting through. So add it all up, maybe five months, mm -hmm. you know, probably, well, yeah, that's my best guess, five months. You'll have to check with somebody who remembers better. Uh, and how long were you in Germany? I was in Germany, let's see, two years minus five months is 19 months. Okay. Um, so when you were in Iraq, did you see any combat action? Yeah, yeah, actually. Uh, bear in mind, it's for me at least, uh, I didn't do much. And that has largely to do with the terrain. Uh, there's not a hell of a lot of call for mortar fire on absolutely flat terrain, mm -hmm. you know. We fired four fire missions. Uh, one, supposedly, we got steel on steel, which is a direct hit. Hard to do with an indirect weapon that you shoot up to a certain angle at a certain point and then it falls. On an MTLB, which I think is an armored vehicle that they use for Camo and other like heads quartery sort of things, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know how you would, who confirmed that? Maybe one of the forward observers. I didn't do much, uh, but other people in my troop and other people in my squadron and my regiment did quite a bit. 
Uh, it's the Battle of the 73rd Easting. And it was one that actually made its way into the textbooks for, you know, this is the way you go about this. This is the, the modern blitzkrieg, the air land doctrine, right? Do yeah. it just like this. So, but because you were a mortarman and therefore a little bit behind sort of the front wave. A little bit behind. Uh, again, the guys are, uh, you know, as you know, like maybe half a mile away from each other. It strikes me a lot like naval warfare. You know, not much boarding with cutlasses, uh, but people swapping shots, and our optics were far superior to the old Soviet stuff that the Iraqis had been sold. Uh, so that also made a huge difference, I think, probably more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, there's that, and you just kind of sit and wait, and maybe they'll want light, maybe they'll want smoke. No, they want high explosive, they want it now. I think we took out a phone pole that was hidden behind some dunes and somebody thought it looked like a barrel of an artillery piece. Uh, so that was the other, the other two fire missions I don't really remember. Okay. Um, so having seen some combat, how did you feel about witnessing casualties and destruction? Uh, well, you don't like it necessarily. Um, like when we got steel on steel on the MTLB, looks good in the paperwork, uh, there's always a 50% chance or higher that everybody snuck out the back, back door. They knew they weren't as mobile as us. Mm -hmm. They knew they didn't have as good as arms, as good optics. Maybe they did the sensible thing and split, surrendered, got an MRE in a shower, mm -hmm. you know. You don't really know, I mean, yeah, it's, hmm. by the same, same token, I would rather see my adversary a safe prisoner than a dead casualty. I would also rather see him, uh, you know, I don't want to trade places, I'll put it that way, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. What kinds of friendships and camaraderie did you form while serving and with whom? Uh, the interesting thing about the military compared to civilian life is that it's much more diverse than a civilian occupation. So I met people from different parts of the country, uh, different classes, different ethnic groups that you know you don't necessarily one of our uh, tank mechanics was a Chamorro from Guam. Mortarman from another troop was Lumbee, Lumbee Indian. Um, I think probably the weirdest thing is uh, I got over a long-standing bias uh, against men who wear shorts, which is something I never grew up. Well, it makes sense. You're growing up out in the country. You can't go out and play. You know, in short, you'll skin your knees all up, climbing trees, thorns, other shit. Uh, likewise, you can't do a hell of a lot of work. You'd always be banging your shins on things. And so I always derided such people and held them at arm's length. And I got to know a couple of them, I was like, there's nothing wrong with these guys. They're just from the East Coast. It's an East Coast thing to wear shorts. I'll never do it myself. <laughs> but some perfectly fine people, too. Okay. How did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? Uh, phone calls at what I now realize were obscene times uh, through a payphone. Okay. What did you do for recreation or when you were off duty? Uh, if I was in an extroverted mood, I would go drink. If I was in an introverted mood, I would stay in the billets and read. When you were in the service, did you read for pleasure, and if so, what? Pretty much what I could get. Uh, the choices were limited. Like? Uh, well, actually, I say limited, and I should caution that. Um, I found a book of essays by an English writer named Jonathan Meads that I enjoyed. And that was the thing. You got so many things from Penguin and Picador 
that you wouldn't necessarily see you know on the shelves over here mm -hmm. um, so yeah same approach as when you go to an American bookstore just you know smaller selection but maybe some odd things that we had a base library but most of the things in there were things that I had already read mm -hmm. you know so and of course you know the PX would carry a few romances and westerns so gotcha what particular book would you say influenced your life the most? Mm. I don't know about specific books, specific authors. It's embarrassing when I sit back, philosophize, and think that I've gotten to a nugget of wisdom. Because I've reached that age in my life where I like to lecture my juniors on how they should conduct their lives. Uh, and I've discovered, to my chagrin, that so many of what I thought were original insights are actually cribbed from the works of Robert Anton Wilson and John D. MacDonald. So if you slap those two guys together, pretty much you could save yourselves all my Cracker Barrel lectures. Okay. Did you use libraries when you were in the service? Why or why not? Uh, no. It was a pleasant pick place to sit that was quiet and dry, but the selection was kind of lacking. Okay. So, Was it just that the libraries were mostly for um, the profession, or that just that the selection for pleasure reading was pretty lax? The selection for, for pleasure reading. You know, again, they're, they're aiming at the average, God, this is going to sound snotty, they're aiming at the average 18 to 25 year old, right? And uh, I'd already read most of that stuff. I read most of that stuff when I was 12, mm -hmm. you know, or before, so. Okay. Um, how did you get home? What was, what's the story of coming home? Uh, the story of coming home was going to Fort Dix. From uh, Iraq? No, actually. From Iraq, went back to Germany. Germany waited out the time until I flew to New Jersey. New Jersey, they said, hey guys, you can have a, an exit physical, and we'll check and see if there's anything wrong, but we're backlogged, so if you want to spend another 21 days in the Army, we will accommodate that. If you want to waive that, we can send you home now. No. Yeah. So you forewent your exit physical? Yes. <laughs> there are times I regret it. Uh, I do know one of the things I didn't mention about being in the desert is there's an incredible variety of insect life. Uh, these water bottles, you spill a drop. There's going to be seven flies all there trying to be the first and the biggest, right? Mm -hmm. So I've probably been bitten by one of everything in Mesopotamia. And that would be interesting. I wonder, did they instill any parasites? I don't know. Who knows? You know, I don't know. So. But at that point, you just wanted to go home. At that point, I just wanted to get home, yes. Okay. Fort Dix is boring. Okay. And Fort Dix is in New Jersey. It is. So you just said, nope, I'm done. Got on a plane, went home. Which is what most people in that <laughs> line did. <laughs> okay. And at that point, home was still in Arizona? No. That's something I also left out. Uh, we actually left Arizona when I was three. I'd been back on visits to relatives, of course, but uh, my particular family came back to Illinois. It's almost like they went to Arizona with the express purpose of having me. Um, <laughs> they went to Arizona, had me, came back, had John. Gotcha. So, so home was actually in Illinois. Yes. So when you came back, how were you received by family and friends, your community? Uh, they were glad to see me, but uh, yeah. Gotcha. How did you readjust to civilian life? That's a weird one because it has a creeping effect. Okay. Um, I more and more, not so much right immediately then. I think, you know, the culture shock, of course, of re-entry. But more and more, and this may be just getting older too, I see things that could be run differently. I see processes that I would handle differently myself. I see people 
wriggle out of responsibilities that they are compensated for. I see people underprepare their inferiors, but hold those same inferiors to a high standard. Uh, there is, I think the library could use a lot more of the military. Okay. And it would paradoxically be a kinder, gentler place for the people at the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Sure. Have you remained in contact with or reunited with fellow veterans, and if so, who? No. Every now and then I will Facebook stalk and see what they're up to. Uh, I think I did talk to one guy once, my roommate, the supply corporal, on the phone. And interestingly, we discovered that a guy who was a librarian here was actually a mutual friend of his family's because they came from the same town in Pennsylvania. He was one of those guys who wore shorts. That, you know, gotcha. I, I had harbored the unfair prejudices about for far too long. Mm -hmm. And is there a particular reason why you didn't stay in touch? No, not really. I mean, I think about about those guys fondly. I had a lot of fun with them and they were interesting guys in their different ways. It, the military, again, in terms of personality types, is more diverse than you might think. So, you know, really a weird, interesting bunch of random guys who had the same taste in beer, basically. <laughs> um, I check in every now and then, you know, what. What's my old section sergeant up to? You know, I heard he became a drill sergeant. That had to be interesting. Because uh, he never really had the temperament for it. You know, last I saw, he's uh, happily married and his kids and stepkids are grown and he's about 300 pounds, which. <laughs> gotcha. Are you a member of any veterans organizations? And if so, which? No. What have you done since separating from the military? Ah, let me think about this. Again, with me, chronology is a real problem. Got out, went back to school, um, finished up with a master's, went, as so many people with graduate degrees do, to Bell Sports Warehouse, uh, worked there until something opened up at the university and worked at the library, went to Office of Admissions and Records, came back to the library, changed units. I think that's it. What was your bachelor's degree in? English. Did you get it here at No. UAC? No. I went to a smaller, cheaper, less selective school down the road where, because it was smaller and cheaper, we had smaller classes taught by real PhDs. <laughs> so... Which school did you go to? Eastern. Okay. And so then you said you also had a master's degree. Where did you get the master's and in what? Also English, also Eastern. Right. As a veteran, have you used your local library? Why or why not? Occasionally. I find it uh, less useful to me than Amazon, actually. Uh, but to be fair... Uh, by local library, I'm assuming you mean public or you mean... Either one. Either one. Uh, this is a good place to do recon, actually, but so often the thing you want, somebody else has it. Um, the public library, it's all right at what it tries to do. You can't be all things to all people, you know. So I'm, I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying I don't personally find them all that useful. In general, what has your experience of using the library been like as a veteran? That's interesting, because it's not much different. I mean, it's like, you know, what was my experience of using the library like as a college student? What was my experience like using the library as a Pisces? You know, as a, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's a library. Okay. As a veteran, are there programs or types of books available at the library that you enjoy more than others? Again, sorry, 
I'm going to have to pretty much say the same thing. Yes, but that's because I'm a deeply weird person. It has very little to do with me being a veteran, you know. Okay. As a veteran, is there something you wish you could change about the library that would enhance your enjoyment of it? Yes. Uh, more browsability, please. Uh, no more sending unclassified things to remote storage. How are people to shelf browse through the catalog if something hasn't been assigned to stop buying multiple copies of things when you know that shelf space is already limited, da 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 da. You know that the applied sciences probably has the least need for historical depth in its collection. So if you're going to junk something, do it out of Granger. Um, yeah, I think you could run a tighter ship that could appeal to more people and perhaps be a little less pharaonic in its approach to uh, management. And that's just cold-blooded pragmatism. I tend to get more productivity out of my serfs if I beat them less and feed them better. <laughs> And people look and say, Stuart, your serfs appear fat and rested. And I'm like, yes, they pull harder that way. <laughs> I would like to see this pollinated. Across the entire library. Yes, if you're kind to the students, the students will work harder for you. What's so? Uh... Absolutely. How did your military or wartime experiences affect your life? Uh... People ask questions that I can only give very boring answers to. Uh, it is, some things are ineffably different, but those are often the hardest things to really answer. Uh, some things are about like you would think they might be. Um, you know, I mentioned early on that most YouTube videos kind of reflected basic training, but that's all off when you get to your main duty station. That's all off when you go on field problems, and certainly all off in combat it's, um, or deploying. Um, usually if you just applied Occam's razor, you know, you could approximate what things are like. So not that different except in, in small ways that are hard to pin down. What are some life lessons you learned from military service? Uh, take care of your shit and your shit will take care of you. Uh, never attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity. Understand that stupidity, like being short, being weak, being prone to the flu, is not something people can necessarily help. Uh, try to behave ethically, try to remember that there is another mind behind the eyes that are staring into yours. Um, coordination makes most insoluble problems soluble. Remember there's always a workflow. Uh, and that things go quicker if you don't jam the line trying to impress your boss. Gotcha. How has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Uh, hmm. Things that you see in the headlines that were abstract when you were a child and safe from it, now you realize these abstractions apply to actual people, actual subjectivities. Um, you know, you don't. Hurricane has just made landfall in Puerto Rico. Well, you kind of know what it's like to be wet and hungry. Now, for you, it may have been a couple of days. For these people, it's months. Mm -hmm. So I'd say in a weird way, it seems to increase my empathy. But maybe that's just age. OK. What message would you like to leave for future generations uh, who will hear this interview? Study hard as an undergrad because if you spend too much time in the bars, you will flunk out, you'll go into the factory system of the shitty little small town you're from, you will not save a bit of money, and you'll have to go into the military to finish up your schooling. And look at me now, after learning that lesson, I'm a senior library specialist.
Okay. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? And if so, what? Mm. No, I think this was pretty thorough, I thought, actually. All right. Thank you, Thank you, JJ.